Section 10 of Toto's Merry Winter by Laura E. Richards. This LibriVox recording is in the public domain. Recording by Jude Summers. Chapter 9 The Robber's Misfortune. It was late in the afternoon of the same day. In the cottage at home, all was quiet and peaceful. The grandmother was taking a nap in her room, with the squirrel curled up comfortably on the pillow beside her. In the kitchen, the fire and the kettle were having it all their own way, for though two other members of the family were in the room, they were either asleep or absorbed in their own thoughts, for they gave no sign of their presence. The kettle was in its glory, for Bruin had polished it that very morning, and it shone like the good red gold. It sang its merriest song, and puffed out clouds of snow-white steam from its slender spout. "'Look at me,' it said to the fire. "'Am I not well worth looking at? "'I feel almost sure that I must have turned into gold, "'for I never used to look like this. "'A golden kettle is a rather rare thing, I flatter myself. "'It really seems a pity that there was no one here except the stupid parrot, "'who has gone to sleep, "'and that odious raccoon who always looks at me as if I were a black pot, "'and a cracked pot at that.' "'To be sure,' crackled the fire encouragingly. "'To be sure. But never mind, my dear. "'I admire you immensely, as you know, "'and it is my greatest pleasure to see myself reflected in your bright face.' "'Crick, crack, crickety,' said the fire. Mm -hmm, "'Sing, sing, sing,' sang the kettle. "'And they performed really a very credible duet together. "'Now it happened that the parrot was not asleep although she had the bad taste to turn her back on the fire and the kettle. She was looking out of the window, in fact, and wondering when the wood-pigeon would come back. Though not a bird of specially affectionate nature, Miss Mary was still very fond of Pigeon Pretty, and always missed her when she was away. This afternoon had seemed particularly long, for no one had been in the kitchen save Coon, with whom she was not on very good terms. Now, she thought, it was surely time for her friend to return, and she stretched her neck and peered out of the window, hoping to catch the flutter of the soft brown wings. Instead of this, however, she caught sight of something else, which made her start and ruffle up her feathers and look again with a very different expression. Outside the cottage stood a man, an ill-looking fellow, with a heavy pack strapped on his back. He was looking all about him, examining the outside of the cottage carefully, and evidently listening for any sound that might come from within. All being silent, he stepped to the window, not Miss Mary's window, but the other, and took a long survey of the kitchen, and then, seeing no living creature in it, for the raccoon under the table and the parrot on her perch were both hidden from his view, he laid down his pack, opened the door, and quietly stepped in. An ill-looking fellow, Miss Mary had thought him at first glance, but now, as she noiselessly turned on her perch and looked more closely at him, she thought his aspect positively villainous. He had a hooked nose and a straggling red beard, and his little green eyes twinkled with an evil light as he looked about the cosy kitchen, with all its neat and comfortable appointments. First he stepped to the cupboard, and after examining its contents, he drew out a mutton-bone, which had been put away for Bruin, a hunk of bread, and a cranberry tart, on which he proceeded to make a hearty meal, without troubling himself about knife or fork. He ate hurriedly, looking about him the while, though, curiously enough, he saw neither of the two pairs of bright eyes which were following his every movement. The parrot on her perch sat motionless, not a feather stirring. The raccoon under the table lay crouched against the wall, as still as if he were carved in stone. Even the kettle had stopped singing, and only sent out a low, perturbed murmur from time to time. His meal finished, the rascal, his confidence increasing as the moments went by without interruption, proceeded to warm himself well by the fire, and then on tiptoe to walk about the room peering into cupboards and lockers, opening boxes, 
and pulling out drawers. The parrot's blood boiled with indignation at the sight of this unfeathered vulture, as she mentally termed him, ransacking all the madam's tidy and well-kept stores. But when he opened the drawer in which lay the six silver teaspoons, the pride of the cottage, and the porringer that Toto had inherited from his great-grandfather, when he opened this drawer and with a low whistle of satisfaction drew the precious treasures from their resting place, Miss Mary could contain herself no longer, but clapped her wings and cried in a clear, distinct voice, Stop, thief! The man started violently, and dropping the silver back into the drawer, looked about him in great alarm. At first he saw no one, but presently his eyes fell on the parrot, who sat boldly facing him, her yellow eyes gleaming with anger. His terror changed to fury, and with a muttered oath he stepped forward. "'It was you, was it?' he said fiercely. "'You'll never say stop thief again, my fine bird, for I'll wring your neck before I'm half a minute older.' He stretched his hand toward the parrot, who for her part prepared to fly at him and fight for her life. But at that moment something happened. There was a rushing in the air, there was a yell, as if a dozen wild cats had broken loose, and a heavy body fell on the robber's back, a body which had teeth and claws, an endless number of claws, it seemed, and all were as sharp as daggers, a body which yelled and scratched and bit and tore, till the ruffian, half mad with terror and pain, yelled louder than his assailant. Vainly trying to loosen the clutch of those iron claws, the wretch staggered backward against the hob. Was it accident, or did the kettle by design give a plunge, and come down with a crash, sending a stream of boiling water over his legs? Who can tell? It was a remarkable kettle. But at this last mishap the robber, now fairly beside himself, rushed headlong from the cottage, and, still bearing his terrible burden, fled screaming down the road. At the same moment the door of the grandmother's room was opened hurriedly, and the old lady cried in a trembling voice, "'What what has happened? What is it? Coon, Mary, are you here?' "'I am here, madam,' replied the parrot quickly. "'Coon has just stepped out with, uh, in fact, with an acquaintance. He will be back directly, no doubt.' "'But that fearful noise,' said the grandmother, "'was that of uh, the acquaintance, dear madam,' replied Miss Mary, calmly. "'He was excited uh, about something, and he raised his voice, I confess, "'higher than good breeding usually allows. Yes. "'Have you had a pleasant nap?' "'The old lady, still much mystified, "'though her fears were set at rest by the parrot's quiet confidence, "'returned to her room to put on her cap, "'and to smooth the pretty white curls which her Toto loved.' No sooner was the door closed than the squirrel, who had been fairly dancing up and down with curiosity and eagerness, opened a fire of questions. "'Who was it? What happened? What did he want? Who knocked down the kettle? Why didn't you want Madame to know?' etc. Miss Mary entered into a full account of the thrilling adventure, and had but just finished it, when in walked the raccoon, his eyes sparkling, his tail cocked in its airiest way. "'Well?' cried the parrot eagerly. Is he gone? Yes, my dear, he is gone, replied Coon gaily. Oh, dear me, what a pleasant ride I have had. Why didn't you come too, Miss Mary? You might have held on by his hair. It would have been such fun. Yes, I went on quite a good bit with him, just to show him the way, you know. And then I bade him good-bye, and begged him to come again, but he didn't say he would. Coon shook himself and fairly chuckled with glee, as did his two companions. But presently Miss Mary, quitting her perch, flew to the table, and holding out her claw to the raccoon, said gravely, <coughs> Coon, you have saved my life, and perhaps the madam's and crackers too. Give me your paw, and receive my warmest thanks for your timely aid. We have not been the best of friends lately, she added, but I trust all will be different now. "'And the next time you are invited to a party, "'if you fancy a feather or two to complete your toilet, "'you have only to mention it, "'and I shall be happy to oblige you.' "'As for my part, Miss Mary,' responded the raccoon warmly, "'I beg you to consider me the humblest of your servants from this day forth. "'If you fancy any little relish, such as snails or fat spiders, "'as a change from your everyday diet, 
"'It will be a pleasure for me to procure them for you. "'Beauty,' he continued, with his most gallant bow, "'is enchanting, and valor is enrapturing. "'But beauty and valor combined are—' "'Oh, come!' said the squirrel, who felt rather crusty, "'perhaps because he had not seen the fun, "'and so did not care for the fine speeches. "'Stop bowing and scraping to each other, you two, "'and let us put this distracting-looking room in order "'before Madam comes in again. "'Pick up the kettle, will you, Coon? "'Look, the water is running all over the floor.' "'The raccoon did not answer, "'being apparently very busy setting the chairs straight, "'so Cracker repeated his request in a sharper voice. "'Do you hear me, Coon? "'Please pick up that kettle. "'I cannot do it myself, for it is twice as big as I am, "'but I should think you could lift it easily, now that it is empty.' The raccoon threw a perturbed glance at the kettle, and then said in a tone which tried to be nonchalant, "'Oh, the kettle's all right. It will get up, I suppose, when it feels like it. If it should ask me to help it, of course I would. But perhaps it may prefer the floor for a change. I—I I often lie on the floor myself,' he added. The squirrel stared. "'What do you mean?' he said. "'It isn't alive.' Toto said it wasn't. The raccoon beckoned him aside, and said in a low tone, My good cracker, Toto says a great many things, and no doubt he thinks they are all true. But he is a young boy, and let me tell you, he does not know everything in the world. If that thing is not alive, why did it jump off its seat just at the critical moment and pour hot water over the robber's legs? Did it? exclaimed the squirrel, much impressed. "'Yes, it did,' replied the raccoon emphatically. "'I saw it with these eyes. And I don't deny that it was a great help, Cracker, and that I was very glad the kettle did it. But see now, when a creature has no more self-respect than to lie there for a quarter of an hour, with its head on the other side of the room, without making the smallest attempt to get up and put itself together again, why, I tell you frankly, I don't feel much like assisting it. You never knew one of us to behave in that sort of way, did you? Mm, no, said Cracker doubtfully. But then, if any of us was to lose our heads, we should be dead, shouldn't we? Exactly, cried the raccoon triumphantly. And when that thing loses its head, it isn't dead. That's just the difference. It could go without its head for an hour. I've seen it when Toto took it off. The head, I mean, and forgot to put it on again. I tell you, it just pretends to be dead, so that it can be taken care of and carried about like a baby and given water whenever it is thirsty. A secret, underhand, sly creature, I call it, and I shan't touch it to put its head on again. And that was all the thanks the kettle got for its pains. End of section 10